Hello, my name is Justin Farlow. I'm the co-founder and CTO of Seratni. Uh, and today I'm going to talk about uh, evaluating chimeric antigen receptor libraries in high throughput uh, for the purpose of improving cell therapies and the work that Seratni has done uh, with TWIST. So first, chimeric antigen receptors or CARs are therapeutic multi-domain proteins. Uh, and they rewire a T cell's function. So a car has an architecture that we think of as different sets of domains, a signal sequence, a binder, a hinge, transmembrane, costim, and activation domain. And each of these protein domains are joined together and they are a single uh, amino acid sequence. And so every car has an amino primary amino acid sequence that corresponds uh, to the set of each of those domains. One thing that's different about a car protein is that a CAR protein, uh, when you're designing it as separate from an antibody or a biologic, you have multiple components that are fused into one protein. The protein is expressed in a human cell and likely won't be purified. And three, the characteristics that we tend to think about with respect to a CAR T therapy are cellular properties or cellular characteristics or functions, like the ability for a cell to kill a cell to proliferate uh, or a cell not to exhaust, as opposed to more biophysical or biochemical characteristics uh, like a binding coefficient. So in that way, the properties of cars um, and the way in which we design them is actually distinct from how we would think about or design uh, other proteins like antibodies or biologics. The landscape of how you build this multi-component protein is, is large and is often inaccessible. So there are many options of which signal sequence you could use, which uh, SCFB or binder you should use, uh, all the different hinges, et cetera, which of those are best. And that can actually be, which the choice that you make can actually determine whether or not a receptor is therapeutically useful or not. Uh, the difference between a first generation car, which wasn't therapeutically successful versus the current cars approved by the FDA and are, are are, are, are useful in a therapeutic context um, is the presence of a domain, the presence of a, of a co-stimulation domain. And so there are many of these options. Um, the, the domain itself is actually quite large. It's tens of amino acids. The arrangements matter. And the structure of the protein itself uh, often doesn't exist. Many of these domains don't have uh, solid structures. And even if they did, the structures may not inform how it will affect the cell. Knowing the structure of a co-stimulation domain may not tell you why this protein causes a cell to behave in such a way uh, as to be therapeutically useful. And so the goal at Seratni here is to link those primary amino acid sequences to the primary cell phenotypes. And that's the challenge. So how do we go from this very large combinatorial set of protein designs then we want to ask a question about how the cell behaves, uh, whether or not the activation is tumor specific, the cells are being activated and kill and proliferate uh, in a way that they're supposed to. And so what we do is we experimentally do the experiment on those cells, uh, find out which ones of those cells and each cell contains a different design, um, which of those designs uh, are found to activate, are found to kill, are found to proliferate, are found to infiltrate. And so that's what we're doing. We're trying to figure out which of these protein designs cause which effect on the cell. So we have a, a workflow uh, that is high throughput that allows us to scale this process. And these are two different uh, properties that we measure. We measure for activation of a T cell, as well as the serial stimulation of a T cell. And they're similar, uh, but they're in one way, uh, they're different by means of how we activate the cells and how we sort and what we're actually looking for. So for activation, we can take a, a set of T cells and maybe even a cell line like jerk cats, and we'll get individual objects in a, in a library into different cells. So every cell has one design. Now we have a pooled set of cells where each cell has a different design and we expose those cells to an antigen presenting cancer cell. Uh, then we have a reporter in those cells and the reporter will light up with a fluorophore uh, under the context of activating a pathway, or it won't light up if that pathway is not activated. And that then allows us to sort those cells which are active from those cells which are not, 
we can then sequence those cells and figure out which designs are more commonly represented in the population of cells that have been activated and which of the designs are more commonly represented in those populations which were not activated. And this allows us to then rank those designs to figure out which designs are more active, middling active, or less active. We can do the same thing in the context of using primary cells uh, for properties like serial killing or serial degranulation, uh, where we have a pool of primary cells. We can then, over the course of many days, continue to present antigen cells to those primary T cells. Uh, then we can measure how those cells uh, are, are expressing CD107A, uh, which is a, a marker for degranulation, which is one of the ways in which uh, T cells are actually able to kill an antigen presenting cancer cell. We can sort those cells that have that ability to kill in response to these antigens presenting cells and those cells that are not able to respond uh, to the antigen presenting cells. And in that way, we can ask questions about how well uh, individual designs again uh, perform in a primary cell context. So this is the gist of our workflow and we can change the different properties that we stain for or the properties that we, the, the pathways that we measure. But at the end of the day, we're able to read out which designs are enriched for high performance and which are enriched uh, for poor performance. And that allows us to get a feel for which of those designs are contributing to the cellular property, the cellular performance. So we built two uh, libraries evaluate, and we evaluated these. We Twist uh, helped us manufacture these very large libraries of these uh, chimeric antigen receptors. The first library was focused on the extracellular domain, the binding domain, specifically the SCFV and how the SCFV links to the car. This library uh, had 64 different objects in it where we played with the signal sequence, uh, the identity of the first and the second chain, uh, the linker between those chains, as well as the hinge. The intracellular domain of the car was kept constant. And for these assays, we were just measuring how well these different binding regions uh, activated cells and how well they responded to antigen presentation versus not antigen presentation. So did they activate when there was no antigen present? And did they activate uh, when there was antigen present? And you're looking for those cells which are only turning on when antigen is present and are not turning on uh, when antigen is not present. So this helped us filter out those SCFEs which were responsive to antigen. The second library we built followed up on that first and we took the best binders from that first library. And this was a much larger library where we actually uh, had various components for the intracellular region uh, of, the, of the car. And in this context, we had those SCFEs that performed well in the first library as well as a set of 16 different hinges, two transmembrane domains, and 51 costim and activation domains. So sometimes we varied the activation domain, sometimes we varied the costim domain, sometimes we removed the activation or the costim domain. So we had 51 options, and that produced a library of about 8,000 different receptors. And this we measured not just for activation, but we also put this library into primary cells where we were able to measure the proliferation in a serial context, as well as the degranulation after serial stimulation. So results from the first library. One of the ways we can think about the results is we tried all of these different domains. Which of those domains were good ones? Which of those domains worked for our purpose? And so we're able to, to figure out which of these components contributed to the property that we measured. And again, in this context, the property we were measuring was T-cell activation. And so we're able to both pick out which specific receptors of the 64 actually activated the way we expected, but we're also able to build a figure uh, like you see on your right, where we can attribute which of those designs or which of those components of the designs are repeatedly found in those that are active versus inactive. So you, look in, you can look at the bottom uh, the purple uh, bars there from hinges. We have two different hinges. And in one context, whenever that hinge is used, those cells generally are able to activate in, in response to antigen. Whereas the, the one on the, on the left, on the lower side, those hinges don't respond as well uh, when presented with antigen. And so you can then look at the, 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 the light blue uh, linkers and you can say of the four linkers, they're pretty similar 
But the third one there generally is less robust and generally uh, was associated with cells that don't activate as well. So again, this allows us to attribute which designs are good, which components of those designs are good. And then we also get a, a third piece of information, which are the actual specific relationships uh, in these designs. And if you double clicked on, on those hinges, you know, why is one good and one bad? Uh, well, you can actually do that. And you see that in some contexts with certain SCFEs, that first hinge just doesn't perform very well. But in other contexts, it actually seems to actually perform similarly to hinge two. And so these rules can get complicated. The way in which you should put these protein domains together, the way in which they interact. Some biology is always strange and you never know what's going to show up. And so trying to collect those rules and keep track of them uh, so that we can build better proteins in the future is one of the goals uh, that we're trying to do here. But what we're able to show is that we're able to, in high throughput, in, in a pool of 64 different designs, able to figure out which of those domains are contributing to the cellular properties, uh, which, of the component, which of the full length car designs are best for those cellular properties, as well as what are the relationships between those domains that allow the cell to have those properties. We scaled this up. So then we followed up the, the similar kinds of assays, uh, but in this context with a mu that much larger library uh, of thousands of designs. And this allowed us to build a similar kind of graph and attribute the SCFV, the hinges, the transmembranes, and all of those intracellular domains to the activation of these cells. And you can very clearly see that the presence or absence of some of these activation domains really matters. Um, transmembrane domains also seem to matter. Once you pick a good SCFE for the purposes of activation, that seemed pretty constant. Um, once you've chosen that good SCFV, um, changing the intracellular side of the car seems to matter more. Hinges also, there's, there's some reliance on what those hinges are for the purposes of activation. And then we're able to measure another property degranulation. So this is again a serial degranulation where we stimulate primary T cells uh, over three repeated stimulations and measure which of those components are contributing to having a significant amount of degranulation after the third stimulation versus those that don't. And we can add other properties to this. So these are the properties, some of the properties that we're measuring right now. Um, and we can do this in primary T cells. You can imagine this works in other cell types as well. And you can put in other libraries that are built on the, the kinds of features uh, that are important to you, either that you really want to explore um, or properties that you might not you, you might not understand yet and you're trying to figure out and discover something brand new. So are you trying to optimize this receptor to have the right set of domains or are you trying to find a new set of domains that you might not otherwise have used? So this is, these are another way to think about some of the, the information that we can pull out from that single experiment. And this is how to relate between domains. So if we have a set of costims and you could imagine you have costim one, costim two, costim three, well, which is performing better than another for your property? And again, better is a subjective term, but in this context, I'll use it as shorthand for more more activity, more degranulation, more proliferation. And so in the, the first box up there, um, if we just have CD3 zeta alone and no co-stimulation, uh, then we add in a, a first domain. Um, uh, we see that that first domain generally ranks to the left. It ranks, it, it usually shows up in very low rankings relative to all of the other designs. But if we add co-stim2, yeah, that's actually above median. It's actually performing generally pretty well. We had COSTIM3, and all of a sudden, those designs just constantly show up as outperforming their neighbors, outperforming other designs. So this is a way for us to think about how to rank these different designs based on the components in those designs. You can look at mutations. So not just the presence or absence of a co-stimulation domain, but mutations. So we can take CD3 zeta, we can make an individual mutation, we can make a second mutation, and we can make a third mutation. And we can start to rank how well those mutations perform against each other. Finally, you can have things that aren't CD3 zeta, some other activation domain paired with a common co-stimulation domain. So variations. So in one, we have the presence or absence of a co-stim. In one, we have mutations of the activation domain. And then in a third question that we asked, 
it's which different activation domain uh, do we think would, would perform best for these properties? And all of these questions were able to be answered in that single library. So one big library allows you to ask many questions at once. And what's nice is the library doesn't, doesn't the effort doesn't scale with the number of questions that you ask. Adding one or two more objects to that library that allows you to ask that other control that you're curious about doesn't actually uh, cost any more effort uh, in the lab once you're building this. Building 64 is pretty similar to building 65 or building 66. And even building 66 is pretty similar to building 1,000 or, or assaying 1,000. Building, that's, that's up to twist. But the assaying part um, remains constant no matter how, build, how large you build your library up to a point. So this larger library, um, this is an illustration of the diversity of that library. So these aren't small changes that can fit within the size of a primer uh, of a small piece of DNA, but these are actually large changes. And this library was built to push those edges. Can we build things with very large differences, some with truncations, but at the same time, can we also build something that's identical except for a mutation? And so this library had these 51 different sets of intracellular domains that contained activation domains uh, of various types, co-stimulation domains of various identities, of various truncations, of various mutations. Um, the hinges there are represented to scale, uh, two different transmembrane domains, and the SCFVs themselves also had the arrangements of the chains, different linkers between them, different signal sequences, and all of these objects were combined in a combinatorial fashion uh, to produce those, those thousands of objects. And this is a little bit of a complicated figure, but if you just look at the top uh, that's, that's shaded uh, in, in red there, that is how we stacked all of those 51 different domains, intracellular domains, up against each other. In this context, this is for proliferation. So the far left, um, th those, that domain, that set of intracellular domains uh, proliferated more readily when presented with antigen uh, than the domains on the very, very far right, which didn't have much proliferation uh, in the presence of antigen. And you can see we, we've got CD3 zeta marked there, and we've got 41BB with CD3 zeta marked there. Uh, and what we did here is, is uh, um, plenty of caveats, lots of caveats. But if you go back into the literature um, and the, over the course of the history of these chimeric antigen receptors, people are oftentimes trying to figure out, is mine better than, than the state of the art? Is mine more proliferative, more active? Whatever the question is, you're measuring the cells, how do my cells perform relative to what other people have done? And what we find is that when we do those one-on-one -on -one comparisons um, and we chart them on this chart, they align with what we saw in one experiment and in high throughput. Compare X against Y, X outperformed Y. We saw that too. A against B, we also saw that. And you can go down the list. And there were some various deviations. There were some places where it wasn't as clear uh, that what we saw had matched the literature, but those were actually uh, not common. And in some cases, when you go into the literature and dig deeply into what that design actually is, you find a distinction that might actually be the reason why there's a difference. So the blue uh, objects there were out of order with respect to, to what we had seen in high throughput. Um, but if you go dig deeper, you realize they had different transmembrane domains uh, than we used. And so it may be the case that you're actually able to, to find and pull out those distinctions based on this high throughput data. So again, this is demonstrating the ability to, in very high throughput, uh, rank these designs uh, and even doing decades worth of, of, of comparisons uh, in a single uh, assay. And this allows us to find those patterns. And so you could imagine on one of the, the efforts of Serotony is to build the software that allows us to both design these in high throughput, but also evaluate them in high throughput. And we are able to build up this database of designs. What are the components in those different designs? And how well do those designs perform for each of the relevant therapeutic properties? And then you can start to pick out uh, any given object and say, well, how well does it perform on the properties that I care about? 
And it may not be that the property you care about is the very most highest activation and the most proliferation and the most surface expression, but you can actually organize and figure out which designs would be best for your application uh, by being able to collect this much data. And so these very high throughput libraries have allowed us to produce this, this high quantity of data and also high quality of data that's well structured. And this is what the foundation is to allow us to correlate how well those designs and those primary amino acids uh, actually affect the way the primary cell behaves. And that was really uh, what we were trying to achieve in the first place. Um, as an aside, this data is both high enough quantity and high enough quality uh, that we're actually able to use uh, machine learning algorithms uh, to, to introspect into that data and to find some of the patterns that we would see otherwise. And so we can take the data that's found in very high throughput, we can run uh, uh, relatively standard uh, machine learning processes over that, we can encode those primary amino acids uh, using some common uh, embeddings, and if we look at the figures down at the bottom, you see a bunch of scattered dots, and that's an untrained uh, uh, model where it, when it guesses whether a dot should be red or blue, and it gets it wrong, or you can't find any pattern there. On the other hand, once you have trained these models, you could imagine if the, se if the sequence that you have a question about is similar to and falls in the red region, it'll make a prediction that that's probably going to activate. But if it falls in the blue region, it probably won't activate. And in that context, we built machine learning uh, systems that can be significantly better predictive than chance. In this context, an F1 score of about 0.8 roughly kind of means uh, that it can be as much as 80% predictive um, about whether that primary amino acid sequence will have the phenotype that you care about. And that then allows us to make those predictions. If I give you just the primary amino acid sequence, um, can you make a prediction about how a cell will behave when it expresses that sequence. And that's back to the original idea. Can we link the primary amino acid sequence to the primary cell function? And I'd like to present that what we've done is this high throughput synthetic biology, and that enables uh, these ambitious experiments uh, that are therapeutically relevant, and that we can then start to explore this enormous landscape uh, of, of these combinatorial uh, multi-domain proteins and that we're able to link that primary amino acid sequence to the primary cell phenotype. And this, we have this large combinatorial design space and it requires such a high throughput platform. And that this process, this machine driven evolutionary process allows us to select those cells that contain the designs that have the improved phenotypes that we care about therapeutically and that the platform actually produces these hits. So you can both find domains uh, that are completely novel and useful to file broad intellectual property on, but you can also find individual designs and individual receptors uh, that you can use as candidates, uh, uh, as a therapeutic candidate for, for downstream work, as well as the patterns that allow you to improve how you go ahead and build uh, and, and understand these, this protein design space. And therapeutic multi-domain proteins are not just CARs, they include other proteins, uh, and there are an increasingly large number of these proteins that are expressed in a human cell, uh, where they're changing the cell itself, and by changing the combinations, the arrangements, and the identities of those protein domains, you change the therapeutic outcome. And with that, I'd like to say thank you. Um, again, my name is Justin Farlow. Um, uh, it represents Saratni here, and this work couldn't have been done uh, without the TWIST team. Uh, specifically, uh, we worked with, um, with Aaron, and I uh, want to say thank you uh, for, for that help, uh, and I'm here and happy to answer any questions. Thank you.